we, which we will discuss in a moment, but let me just first start with a recap of what we did yesterday. Uh, I introduced you one of the main techniques for reinforcement learning, which is a set of techniques in computer science and machine learning for learning strategies. And that main technique, which we discussed yesterday, today we will get to learn a few others, uh, is called policy gradient. And as the name implies, uh, you're looking at a policy that is a strategy, and you're encoding it in such a way that you can actually take gradients through the policy. So the policy is really a mapping from the observed state of the environment of the world around you to an action. But uh, it's formulated in terms of a conditional probability. So the probability of taking a certain action given a state. And then if you parameterize this a set of probabilities, you automatically get something through which you can take gradients. So that is the setup of policy gradient. And more generally, the setup of reinforcement learning is having this agent interact with an environment. And it's the policy of the agent that you want to improve over time. OK, so now let me move forward to where we left off yesterday. So this is the second simplest uh, reinforcement learning example that I introduced to you just before we finished. Uh, remember, the first example was simply a random walker where the reward was based on how far it gets. And then, of course, the solution is that it should have a probability of one of moving in the correct direction. Uh, that was still a little bit um, insufficient to cover the whole domain of reinforcement learning because in that case, the action that the random walker took was not even dependent on its position. It just had to decide whether to move up or down. Here we have something more interesting I introduced to you. So here we have, again, a random walker. In this case, it has a probability of either moving up or staying put. And in this case, the random walker will be asked to stay as long as possible on a certain target site. So in order to be able to do that, it somehow has to have information about the position of the target site. Otherwise, it's, if it's completely blind, it will never be able to solve the task. Um, unless you were to put the target site always at the same spot, then it could count the number of steps. But let's say the target site is chosen randomly in each run of the game. So it needs some kind of observation. You could think of many possible kinds of observations. But the observation you might choose is that it has a local sensor that is able to detect whether it is currently on the target site or not. So the state space, the observation space, is just 0 or 1, depending on whether it is on the target site or not. And the action space is also two-dimensional, whether to move or to stay. So uh, here, for the first time, we do have a policy that depends on the state. Um, and then you can apply the standard uh, policy gradient reinforcement learning approach that we learned about with a reward that is given by the amount of time steps that it did stay on the target site. So who tried to solve it? OK, so there was at least more than zero <laughs> people who tried to solve it. If you didn't, uh, feel free to uh, try it over the weekend or next week um, during the workshop uh, because it's, it's really nice to see in, in one simple case where you don't even need a neural network and don't need anything fancy that this actually works and how it works. But I will show you uh, some of the numerical results. So um, what you see here is the progress at different stages of the training. So we always are looking at uh, kind of uh, space-time diagrams. And space runs uh, on the vertical axis, time runs on the horizontal axis. And in each of these diagrams, I should say, I have tested an agent that was trained for a certain amount of time. To the left, it had not been trained at all. I tested it by running several trajectories. Remember, the trajectories are probabilistic. And I also made sure that for these test cases, I always put the target site at the same location so that it becomes visually a little bit easier to identify what's going on. But of course, during training and also during real testing, the target site will be chosen randomly. Otherwise, it would be too simple. So what you can see in the leftmost picture is basically the status uh, near the very beginning of training 
what we have is simply a random walk with drift, so it's going upward, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but it doesn't know really about a target site. Um, here the location of the target site is actually indicated by a dashed line. So what happens after a little bit of training is that sometimes it already latches onto this target site. So you see here clearly there is a tendency for it to, to stay there for some time and then maybe to move on. And as training progresses further here in the plots to the right, it really knows exactly what to do to move as fast as possible initially. And then once it hits the target site, it wants to stay. So apparently, yes, it has learned how to do the right thing. And the only signal that it used was this reward signal that after the end of each trajectory told it a number that is say plus five if it was staying for five units on the target site. But of course, this, this is only a number, yeah? It does some funny random stuff, it gets announced this number, and it does some random funny stuff again, and it gets announced another number. So uh, imagine you would be doing this as a human you would also need quite, a, quite a, many attempts to actually figure out what's going on, yeah? Because no one is teaching you, oh, you got this reward of plus five because in this time interval you stayed on, on the correct target site and you realized that this information is missing. It's only a number, this reward. So you have to try many, many times. And in this case, uh, you're using policy gradient. That is, in all the cases where you get a relatively high reward, you say, okay, obviously I did something right, so let me reinforce, increase uh, the probabilities of those actions that I took in this trajectory, which may have been whenever I did get a signal of zero from my sensor, which means not on the target site. I had a relatively high probability of moving up, so let me reinforce this. And whenever I got a signal one, which of course we know <laughs> means uh, you are on the target site, I happened to have a large probability of staying, and so I should really reinforce this. Okay, so this is how it goes. You can also um, plot the evolution of the policy visualized in terms of these probabilities. And remember, state space is two-dimensional. For each state, I also have two actions, but since the probabilities for the two different actions are normalized, I only need to plot one. So in total, I need to plot uh, one probabilities uh, for each state. So on the vertical, I put the probability for uh, remaining at rest, zero, given that uh, my sensor gives me signal one, which means I'm on the target side. We know this should be large, ideally. And on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the probability of moving, given that my sensor tells me zero, so I'm not on the target side. Again, we know this should be large. No? And so wherever you start, you can start at random places initially. Uh, you will by this policy gradient procedure, move in a kind of random walk in parameter space because all of this is stochastic. I'm running a batch of trajectories getting random uh, rewards, so nothing is deterministic, but there is an uh, unmistakable drift. And so eventually all these drifting training trajectories are converging to the right spot, which is the fixed point. So I'm staying put when I'm on the target side and I'm moving otherwise. So you see, this actually works. Any questions about this example? And if you implement it, uh, play around with, say, the batch size, if the batch size of trajectories that you're training on would be smaller or the learning rate larger, then these uh, training trajectories in parameter space would uh, look much more noisy, but also it could potentially be faster, so you can play around. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a general question that we can now ask. How should we parameterize the action probabilities? I gave you the hint yesterday that just proceed in this particular case, uh, uh, just like the ansatz with the sigmoid that we introduced already for the simple walker, only now you have, of course, two different states, so you will have two different parameters, theta, so then you go. But in general, what would you do? And so in general, your state space may be much larger and also your action space can be quite significantly larger. And then you can use all the techniques that you learned in the beginning of this week. Namely, you can use a neural network where the input would be the state and the output, at the different output neurons would be the different probabilities for the different actions. So I'm, I have drawn, in, drawn it again for this very simple example where the input was just are we on the target, zero or one, so it would be a single neuron. 
But again, this input now could be an image, maybe the image from the video camera <laughs> of your robot. Uh, so then it would have much more neurons. Then you have a few hidden layers here, only one. And then you have the output, which is to stay or to move. And the values of these neurons would give you the policy, so the probability of an action given a state. So it's as simple as that. And in this case, the thetas are not parameters that you write into your ansatz, but these are simply the weights and biases of the neural network. And now since the output represents the probabilities of uh, different actions, they have to normalize, uh, sum up to one, they have to be normalized. And so uh, you already learned, I think, from Eliska how you would do that. You would use a softmax uh, activation for the very last layer, which is exactly of this type, um, that it makes sure that you can interpret the last uh, activations as probabilities because they will be uh, between zero and one and they will be normalized. Okay. So that's a powerful technique. So suddenly you start parametrizing in this very arbitrary way. And if the input were an image, you could use things like convolutional layers, obviously. So let me summarize then. Uh, how does this policy gradient work um, if we want to run it, including the neural network and so on? So first, uh, let's talk about obtaining one trajectory. What are the steps? Well, as you go through the trajectory, you will execute an action that you've selected previously, and you will record the new state. And so this is typically, in a computer program, done by, by calling a function that represents the environment. So you tell this function, please, I want to do this state, uh, this action, so I want to move up or left, for example. And then this function internally will have the logic of the game embedded, and it will return to you the new state, which might be the observed image you have, or only the zero or one in our case. So there will always be this environment. And um, sometimes it's you that programs the environment, uh, then you can do tricks like uh, vectorizing it, for example, if it's a physics simulation, so to speed it up. But sometimes this is also a black box. I mean, it could be a black box because it's another computer program to which you have no access except on this interface. Like uh, initially they were trying out these things on video games, so maybe you don't have the code directly available of the video game. Or maybe this is literally the controller of an actual robot moving around in the real world. Yeah. Okay, so you now got your new state. You will now feed this new observed state into your neural network to get the action probabilities for the next action. And then you will sample from these action probabilities. So you will pick the different actions depending on this probability distribution uh, so as to obtain the action for the next step. And then you go on and you go on and you go on until you reach the end of the trajectory. And that is either defined by saying, oh, we have a limited amount of time, or maybe we reach some goal up to a certain precision, so that depends on you how to define it. Okay. And then at the end of the trajectory, you will actually get a reward. So, so now we have done one trajectory. In reality, it will maybe be even a batch of trajectory, depending on how you implement it. You will obtain the overall sum of rewards, that is the return for each of these trajectories. And now you can apply the reinforcement learning policy gradient technique. So um, you will look at the actions that have been taken and also the corresponding states in all of these uh, trajectories. And you will enhance the uh, probabilities by this grad of log of the probability formula. Uh, with a special emphasis on the high return trajectories because it was the return times the grad of the log of the probability in which you are moving your theta parameters. Okay, and so then uh, that is the whole pipeline, but how would you actually implement this? And here's a little trick. Um, remember, so we said we have the neural network into which you feed the state and get the action probabilities using softmax, for example. Um, and now you want to implement this uh, reinforcement learning policy gradient update, the R grad log of P. But you want, ideally, to phrase it in, in terms of things that you already know for neural network supervised learning. 
And so what you can use is a trick, namely to use this categorical cross entropy, which you did, I think, come across, right? So if you want to categorize images, for example, you say the neural network will also output you things that you can interpret as probabilities, the probability that this image is a cat or this is image is a dog. And then if you want to compare against the correct solution, you will use a cost function that looks like this, this categorical cross entropy, which is always there to compare some uh, desired uh, probability distribution against an actual probability distribution that your neural network produces for you. And so we will do the same here, except uh, for each time step in each trajectory, as the desired probability distribution in terms of this categorical cross entropy, we will use a probability distribution that is very simple, which, is only which only has a non-zero entry for the action that was actually taken in this particular trajectory. Yeah? Because we want to reinforce that particular action. We want to reinforce it particularly if it had a high reward, and we can even do this by, well, by cheating a little bit, so we could, we could adapt the learning rate or something, but we can actually cheat, so we can just put for the desired distribution at the action location that was taken at this time step in this trajectory, we can put capital R, the total <laughs> return for this trajectory. This is not normalized, but somehow all the machine learning frameworks don't check this <laughs> and they don't worry about this. Yeah. So um, P of A will be R for the action that was taken, zero for all the other actions, and then uh, you have log of the uh, of the neural network expression for A given S. So S is the state that uh, was present at this uh, point in time. And again, A is the action that was taken. And if you do it like this and implement this cost function and then use your usual neural network routines uh, to minimize this cost function, you will get the right result. So the neural, uh, the neural network optimizer will take the gradient with respect to theta of this expression and if you work it out and think about it, this is exactly the policy gradient reinforcement learning update. And you can use the batch uh, averages and everything uh, that you uh, have. And depending on how you implement it, you can use it in a very smart way. So you can say, I take all the time steps of all the trajectories that I'm currently considering. So these can be many. I put them in one giant batch. Uh, and in this batch, there will always be pairs of states and actions. And um, the state is, so to speak, the input and the uh, action, or rather this P of A, uh, probability distribution that has an R at, in the right spot, uh, will be the desired output of the neural network. And then it becomes like a, re a supervised learning problem. A large set of states and a large set of desired probability distributions constructed in this way and you take, uh, take this gradient of the cost function. So that works. Uh, I, I put it as an example to make it really clear here. I don't know, you are all using different uh, machine learning frameworks. For a long time, we had been using uh, Keras with TensorFlow, and, but it works the same on, in all the frameworks. So what you would have is a large array, which is the inputs, the states, so this uh, would have a size n times the state size. So state size is, well, depending on how large is your state, so 784 is a, if it's a 28 by 28 pixel image, for example. But n would be really the number of state action combinations that you um, consider. So could be the number of trajectories in the batch multiplied by the number of time steps for, for each of these trajectories. So you have this. Uh, gigantic array for the, all the inputs representing all the time steps. And then you also have this big uh, array of desired outputs, which again is an array of size n that, that now becomes the batch size times the number of actions because that's the size of the output for each neural network. Yeah? And so if you then say train on this batch with the categorical cross entropy that you specified earlier, uh, you get exactly the right thing. Okay, so are there questions about these technicalities? But they are very convenient. And you see how it all can be drawn back to supervised learning. Apparently no questions. Good. Yeah, so if you, if you now were to do the target walker example, 
you cannot only solve it uh, in, in the way that we described, but you can also use, use a neural network. And if you use a neural network, maybe then you can also change the state space, if you like, in order to explore a little bit more. Okay, and so let me uh, wrap up this policy gradient setting by talking a little bit about AlphaGo. So as I said in the very beginning in the introduction, Go was considered a, and is considered a very complex board game simply because of the sheer number of possibilities uh, to play. And so it was unclear how to really solve it competitively with a computer. Um, so what they did, uh, what DeepMind did in this AlphaGo paper, in this very first paper on the subject matter, then they, there came others, uh, was the following. So they started actually with supervised learning. They looked at a big database of games played by expert players, and they tried to, so to speak, set up a neural network that would be able to mimic these expert players. So looking at a given state, the board, image of the board, um, it was known which move the expert player would play for this particular state because it's a state in one of those games in the database. And so what they did is apply exactly what I just explained for reinforcement learning. They now applied it in the supervised learning fashion. So they had a neural network that already was set up uh, to give you a policy, so to give a probability of a certain action that is a move uh, given the observed state. Uh, but instead of uh, using reinforcement learning on these many randomly sampled trajectories, they would just use it to increase the likelihood that the neural network would propose the action that the expert player had made in this particular observed state, uh, which you can uh, do in this way. And this, again, it looks like reinforcement learning, or you could say this is just the categorical cost entropy cost function, just to mim mimic expert players. So this was the first step. Later, they co got completely rid of this step, actually, and I will comment on that in a moment, but in, at the first day, they started like this. And then here, I just want to to highlight that, yes, they were using uh, the policy gradient reinforcement learning. So this is in the paper. Uh, this is the first time that I also read about this formula back then. So uh, in this case, they call the reward Z. Uh, and this is the, just the reward for winning or losing a game, so plus one or minus one in the end. And here you see that um, you try to change, in this case, theta is called rho, so <laughs> sorry for the change in notation. Uh, you try to increase the log likelihood of the probability for taking uh, actions uh, weighted according to the final reward. So if the final reward was good and you won the game, then you will increase the, all the probabilities. If the final reward was bad and you lost the game, you will suppress all the probabilities. That makes sense. And so, uh, Here's a kind of visualization of the policy network that they took. Forget the middle column, that's another thing that we will discuss later today. But here's the policy network. So the input is really an image of the whole board. And then it's processed in multiple steps by a convolutional neural network because that's perfect for processing images. And in the very end, the output is also an image because it's the action probabilities on this board, so where to put the next stone. So if one of these green bars is high, that means a high probability. So it's quite likely that when you sample from this probability distribution, you will put your stone there. And if you have a smaller bar, then it's a smaller probability. And you just make sure that it's normalized and off you go. So it's all nicely compatible with the technology of convolutional neural networks. So this was, of course, also nice. I should say, okay, there's a reason why there's a so-called value network, so it's a bit more uh, advanced uh, technique than the standard uh, policy gradient that we discussed. Also, they had another kind of thing, which was more search type thing, so it was quite a bit more advanced that, than what I've been discussing right now. But at the heart of it, um, uh, this is, so to speak, policy gradient. Okay, and so here are some results. And the results I'm showing here are already from a later paper. So what you see um, on the vertical axis is some rating of the strength of the play of this neural network. Here's the training time in hours, um, and don't ask me how big was their cluster. So, <laughs> um, so what they 
what they are showing here is, is several things. So, um, so the purple curve would be purely supervised learning on expert players. And then the dashed line was already a little bit better. This was in their first paper when they started with supervised learning, but then also uh, introduced reinforcement learning. And I should say something about the reinforcement learning. So how do you do reinforcement learning for a game? Uh, when it's a video game, you can just run the video game many times. But when it's a board game, it seems like you would have to play against human players many times. But this is completely out of the question for the number of games they played here. How would you have this army of super great <laughs> human players that is willing to play for years <laughs> against your computer program? So what they did instead was something very smart. They took, they took the current version of the program, they freeze it at some point, and then they let it play against this version, so against itself or against a slightly earlier version of itself. And then this, this is perfect because first you get rid of the human players, but second also it's always roughly compatible playing level, which is super important because if you were always to play against the best player in the world and you always lose, I mean, you don't get any reward, yeah? I, I, you don't get any reward signal, you just get minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. You never will get any gradient, you will never change anything, and that's of course also true for humans, yeah? I don't, <laughs> I don't like to play against a really strong chess player, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you don't get any reward signal. Um, whereas if you all, always play against someone who's about as strong as you are, then you sometimes win, you sometimes lose, and then you get really a reward signal and you can improve. And so they improved in this way against uh, themselves. Okay, and so now the blue curve is the fantastic thing. The blue curve is their later version, which was called AlphaGo Zero, and it was called Zero because it did not start by training on expert moves. It started completely from scratch with some random probabilities and playing against itself. And of course, in the beginning, it's super bad, yeah? And it doesn't improve very, very quickly because it is basically just learning about the rules of the game from, 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 uh, from, from scratch. Eventually it becomes better, it becomes as good as even the earlier version of AlphaGo, and then you see this little jump, it really takes off and reaches a completely different level. And so that, that is very surprising and remarkable, and it also relates a little bit to what one does observe uh, for humans. So there are many stories of biographies of famous scientists who were, so to speak, self-taught and, and got to a completely different level, probably also because they were first struggling very much to teach these things to themselves. So, so apparently this is something, if you only learn from the experts, you are getting stuck in a certain mode of thinking, but <laughs> Uh, if you do it yourself, you can reach a new level. And so this is the quote I uh, brought in the beginning, that uh, it was then doing moves that no human player would have dared to do. Yes? Can I ask a question about the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought... I always assumed it's the human scale, it's normalized to a human scale, but I'm not an expert in Go, so. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, good, good point. So at least for the expert game database, they could probably do something. And I don't know whether that's sufficient to calibrate it, but I'm not an expert. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So any any questions still about this? Yeah. Uh, you mean an illegal action so that I cannot take? You mean? Ah, yes, but, but here it's a relatively simple game, so um, they will probably mask this, so all the probabilities for illegal placements uh, would be zero. For example, you cannot place a stone on top of another stone, yeah, um, but that's relatively easy. So the easiest way to do it is just to multiply with zero all these places and then to renormalize the rest, and so that's fine. 
Okay, good. So let's move on. So this was policy gradient, where the trick was, even despite having discrete actions, you can turn it into a continuous problem for gradient descent by uh, introducing probabilities. And now uh, we introduce the next big class of reinforcement learning methods. That's called Q-learning. And there's another trick of how to go from discrete actions to continuous numbers. So the, the trick here is to introduce a so-called quality function. That's where the name Q comes from. And this, the purpose of this function is to predict the future expected reward uh, for a given state and a given selected action. So if I'm in this state and I'm selecting this action, and then afterwards play according to the usual policy that I have and also according to the statistics of the environment, what's the expected reward that I will get in the end? And of course, it's pretty clear that the best strategy, if that is a given, uh, should be to select uh, the action currently that has the best uh, quality function because that's the best expected reward. So it goes a little bit in the direction of planning, but the question is, of course, how do you even get this Q function? Who will reveal this Q function to you? So this is a little bit also similar to things that people have been doing when programming computers to play chess or so. There, you also wanted to have a function that evaluates the position and says, oh, this, this, this setup of the board is very favorable for you. This kind of thinking goes on here. Okay, so here's our little robot again with the boxes that it wants to pick up. Um, and now we can introduce several things. So we could say, if we look at each location as a state, we could define something like a value. This is not yet the Q function, but we could say, if I'm in the state and I continue playing the game, uh, what do I expect as a reward, typically? And obviously, if you start out relatively close to one of the boxes, and even if you would have a random walk <laughs> policy, uh, you would be more likely to get a good reward uh, in comparison to if you start out very far away from the boxes. So it's not unreasonable to assume that this value function, I will define it more clearly in a moment, uh, would be bigger near the boxes and smaller away from the boxes. And once you have such a value function, this alone would already be uh, pretty good for, for determining a policy. So if you are at some spot, you could uh, look around and see <laughs> where the value function increases. But this Q function goes one step further. It says it depends not only on the state, but also on the action that you propose to choose. So here I'm plotting the quality of the action going up in dependence on the state, which is the location. And obviously, if you're just below a box and you decide to go up, that's good because you will get a good reward even in the next time step already. So uh, if you then say you run for 10 time steps into the future and count the reward, you expect it to be large. If you're even a little bit uh, away from, so say in this lower right corner, and you go up, then of course you don't immediately collect the box, but you have come closer to the box. And so maybe in the next step, if you do, uh, if you take the next step and move to the left, for example, you will pick up the box, so this is already uh, good as well. Whereas if you are now above the box and you move up, that's probably not so smart. Okay, so that's uh, visualizing the quality function. So let's define things. So uh, I told you in words what the quality function is, but what, what it really means is the quality function for a given state and a given action is the expectation value of the future return R given the state and given that I now take this action. And to be more precise, we assume that all the future steps just follow the current policy. So the Q function is policy dependent. Huh? If I do stupid things, the Q function has lower values and so on. Okay. Um, so I already uh, introduced this uh, future return uh, with the discounting factor if I like. Uh, again, Ideally, you don't have any discounting, but uh, sometimes things run more stable if you say it's more important for me to get an immediate reward and not so much what happens later. Um, and now I can also introduce this value of the state, which is simply uh, what you would get if you take the perfect action. 
Um, so you could say it's the maximum overall actions of Q of S comma A if you already adopt this Q learning policy, which is to take the best action in terms of Q. If you have any other arbitrary policy, you would just average here also over all the actions that your policy will uh, propose to you. So instead of max, you would have the average. Okay, but now the big question is how do we obtain the Q function, yeah? So how would you obtain the Q function, this mysterious Q function, um, if you don't know anything else about the problem? And so maybe, yes, again, you can discuss with your neighbor. So how would you obtain the Q function? Maybe there are some brute force ways of doing it. Yes, and there's still a question. Yes. Uh, so that's the return for the future. So fr from the current time step onwards, I'm summing up all the rewards that I will still get. Because the rewards that had happened previously, I cannot influence them anymore anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if, if gamma is close to zero, I'm very greedy. Then I say only the immediate reward right now counts and the rest doesn't count, and then of course it's super simple, and then I can immediately write down what is the Q function. Yeah, the, the, yeah exactly, the close adds to one, the close adds to what I really want to optimize, and then it becomes difficult. Okay, so please discuss a little bit, at least to start thinking about the Q function. Okay, so maybe still discuss a bit more, but in a minute or so, I want some suggestions.
Okay, so did anyone, does anyone want to mention an opinion? How can we get Q? Maybe some simple method first. What would be the simplest possible way to try to get Q? Yeah. Okay, so um, so let's first, um, so I understand you want some scheme where you initialize the Q value almost zero everywhere, but then you observe, like in the picture that we showed, that obviously when you're very near the target, it's relatively easy to say what's the Q value because you will be very quick to reach the target and somehow you go on from there. That's how I understand you, and yeah, that's, roughly the thing that will happen. I, we could have done something much simpler. We could have literally taken the definition that I gave and say for each state and action, I just run many trajectories according to the policy and take the expectation value, and that's the Q value there. And then I go to the next state and run many trajectories. The re so this works. The reason why this is a little bit wasteful is that imagine you have two states very close by you run many trajectories here, you get the expectation value. You run many trajectories there, you get the expectation value of the return. But if these are close by and I start here and then I move to the right, so I'm in the second state, it seems like the Q function that I have already calculated here should tell me something, that I should be able to reuse this information somehow instead of doing independent Monte Carlo for each of the state action pairs. And so that's the idea uh, of Q learning, which uh, will work by a kind of recursive mechanism and that then uh, implements uh, in mathematical detail what you intuitively understood from the picture. So um, the equation we start from is one of those equations that seems true but a little bit pointless. <laughs> it's uh, called the Bellman equation. It has been around a long time from optimal control theory and works like this, it's a kind of recursive equation. So the Q value of state S and action A is the expectation value of the future return that we know by definition. So what is the future return? Well, it's first the reward that I immediately get. Uh, that I can calculate easily because given the state and given the action that I take, uh, I get the reward. Plus all the remaining rewards. Now, when we have discounting, they will be suppressed anyway by a factor of Q, so, so, but that's a detail. But what are the remaining rewards, or rather what will be the uh, average of the remaining rewards, or sum of rewards? Well, that's again the Q function, but now from the new state that I've reached. So if I started in state S and action A, I will reach a state ST plus one. And then in this state, again, I have a Q function, and again, if my policy is the Q-learning policy, I will select the best action from that point onwards, and that will give me the expected return. And so I have been able to write down an equation that says the Q-function of S, expectation value of an immediate reward, plus the rest, and the rest is again expressed in terms of a Q-function. And it's exactly the situation that I told you. Yeah, If I have two states nearby, and I know that in the first step I go to the, to the other state, I should be able to use the Q function on that state. So this is how it goes. It's also important that here at least uh, some information about the reward is injected, otherwise this whole uh, formula would be very empty. 
But the problem is, of course, that Q uh, appears on the left and on the right-hand side. So it's one of those equations that I still have to solve. Okay. So is this clear? So, so, so the gamma, forget the gamma. The gamma comes in only because of discounting. But what is written here is really the first step reward plus, and then there should be the sum over the rest. But the sum over the rest is, again, a Q function of the new state. And uh, for this particular policy, it would uh, be given by the maximum over all possible actions, because that's, by definition, how the policy works. If I had an arbitrary policy here, it would be an expectation value according to the policy over the different actions that I can take. Okay. Good. So now how do we solve this? And, well, the simplest thing you can try when you have such an equation is some kind of fixed point iteration. Yeah? So, uh, I don't know, if you say x equals cosine x, then you know that on your pocket calculator you can just <laughs> type the cosine, cosine, cosine many times and eventually you will convert. And we can try to do something similar here. So we just say we have a guess for the Q function and we insert that on the right hand side oops, and use it to update to get a new guess for the Q function. And then I, again I insert it into the right hand side and so on and so on and so on. And if I do it in the correct way, hopefully I converge. Now this may be a bit brutal, so instead of just inserting on the right hand side and then immediately updating completely, maybe I just insert on the right hand side and move a little bit in the direction of this. Yeah, so I have smaller steps, that's a bit uh, more stable. So what I can do is this iteration where the new Q function is the old Q function plus some small number times whatever is on the right hand side minus the old uh, Q function. So that's just going a little step in this direction instead of doing a full update step. If alpha were equal to one, I would be doing a full update step because then this Q old and that Q old would completely cancel. Okay, so that's a fixed point iteration. Um, And now we're good, yeah? and what will happen now, i show in a moment, I believe, is exactly graphically what, what you suggested. Yeah? And of course, as usual, we can use a neural network to approximate Q, so even if the state space is large, uh, then, uh, then it will be able to do it. Also, the advantage of a neural network is always it learns to interpolate. So maybe I cannot go to all the possible states because there's too many of them, but the uh, neural network will learn to interpolate. So what it has learned in this set of states, it can also extrapolate to other states. Okay, and so here's an example. Again, here's my target where I get a good reward. And here's the Q function after the first step of this update rule that is given by the Bellman equation. So I already learned that if I'm in this spot and I'm going up, then I will get a good reward. So this is, has some value of the Q function. All the rest is still initialized to zero. But now I apply this Bellman equation again, and uh, now I will learn, okay, if I'm here, I will not get an immediate reward even if I'm moving up, uh, but I will still be good uh, because there, there is a Q function. So, so it's a kind of two-step process. Um, and here I got something because if I'm moving up and then moving left, and I do not show this part of the Q function here because I can only visualize one of the four actions, but then I also got a good uh, reward. So again, by, by the update rule, this also now gets updated to a good value. And so on and so on. So it spreads. It's like an uh, infection that spreads from the center and the Q function will be updated everywhere and eventually it will converge to something. Are there any questions about this? It's a very nice way and it's somehow kind of easy to understand. So imagine a labyrinth, there's some spot that I want to reach. If I'm very close by, it's obvious where I should go. Then if I'm two steps removed, uh, at least in the next iteration, it's obvious where I should go and so on and so on. And so this uh, will spread throughout the labyrinth. Okay, there's still another thing. So initially the Q function is of course arbitrary, maybe it's all zero or it's randomly initialized. And then I may have a problem because if my policy is really done according to select the action with the best Q, 
um, I may select very strange trajectories at first, and maybe I never, I may be stuck in the wrong actions. That's what I want to say. And so what people do is they select uh, with a certain random probability epsilon, they just, uh, with a certain probability epsilon, they just select a random action um, so that you can explore different possibilities. Um, and so that's called exploration. And uh, whenever you, instead of the random action, really follow uh, the Q function, so the max of the Q function, that's called exploitation. And later you can reduce the randomness when you're close to converging. And so here I will give you an example, again a relatively famous example, again from the same company. <laughs> so um, this, was, this was the big example that uh, put them on the scene and they were bought up by Google for an insane amount of money on the strength of <laughs> seeing this example. Yeah. So what they did was combine deep neural networks with image recognition that had just made their big splash in 2012, combine them with reinforcement learning and they did that for video games. So these are the old fashioned games from the 80s. Um, and these days you can run them in an emulator so you don't need to use the actual hardware. Um, and so the thing was the neural network learns to play these games purely by observing the video screen, that's the state input, then outputting actions that is typically just moving up, down, left, right, and getting as reward this high score that uh, these games will give the player, yeah? nothing else. And so at least in many of these action games, it became really good. And there were then other notable examples where it didn't become so good, where you require more long-term thinking, but by now, uh, these kinds of reinforcement learning approaches are also good. And so that's really cue learning. So um, you would take the image as an input, have some a few convolutional layers, then maybe some fully connected layers, and uh, eventually, for the different possible actions, you learn the Q function. So these are not action probabilities like in policy, uh, but really this is Q of S comma A, S being the image and A being one of these discrete actions. So that's the output of this neural network. And then you select the one with the biggest uh, value. And I then went on to, uh, say, visualize the, the knowledge gained by the neural network. So, um, this is, um, as a color scale, the Q function for different states, or maybe it's the value function because it's only the states, <laughs> I don't remember. And so, for example, here you see, if you're looking at a screen with many, so this is one of those Space inv Invaders games where you have to shoot down the alien spaceships. And if you're looking at a screen which still has many alien spaceships, then the value function of this will be large because you expect, oh, now I'm going to get a high reward because I'm shooting down all these alien spaceships. Um, so, so this is visualized in terms of color. And then um, what they also did was, have you talked about TSNE, this visualization technique? It's one of those visualization techniques where you take a very high dimensional, uh, uh, you can take a point cloud in a very high dimensional space and project it down to two dimensions. Um, and people do this, for example, if they're looking at the activation vectors inside a neural network, which are very high dimensional vectors. So they run the possible inputs through the neural network, look at the vectors that come out. They get a point cloud in a high dimensional space and they want to project it down to two dimensions to visualize something and they did that here for the for the last hidden layer of their Q network. And so they understood then that, um, say, similar looking images were grouped together by this neural network. So these are images where, uh, I don't know, only half the alien spaceships in the lower upper right corner are still <laughs> present and, and they, they form some part of the space. Okay. Any questions uh, still here? Yeah. Ah, no, but um, 
at least the policy. So, so do we agree that once the Q function is perfect and it gives me the expected return, I should pick the action that, well, maximizes this expected return, right? I will not just take this or that or that uh, action, right? And so the, the expected return given the current state for the perfect policy is just defined by the maximum over A. And that's why also in this Bellman equation, I put the maximum over A because I want to follow the perfect policy. If I still had a stochastic policy, maybe a policy that doesn't come from Q learning but from something else like policy gradient, I would take the expectation value with respect to the policy of Q of S comma A. But uh, for this particular policy, it's just the maximum. Okay. Good. So then uh, I want to say a few words still about um, what people are using nowadays. And what they are using nowadays is really they are combining both of these approaches, the policy gradient and the value function based approach. And it's called actor critic. And it's called actor critic simply because you think of the policy of the agent, like describing what the actor, the agent should do. And then on the other hand, you still keep a value function that's the critic that says, oh, you're doing good and you're doing not so good. So that's the critic or the value function. Okay, so policy gradient on one hand, Q learning and value-based approaches on the other hand, and in the intersection, the modern actor critic approaches. So what's the idea? Remember at some point I told you that there's this concept of the baseline. And just to recall, um, you have the reinforcement learning update uh, that in policy gradient teaches you to uh, go along the direction that's defined by R times the grad of the log of the action probabilities. But you can play around with the return. You can, for example, shift the return by a constant and you still will get the same uh, exact update on average. However, the variance can change and that's important. So um, if you have an update rule uh, in machine learning in general and you can somehow reduce the variance and still keep the right average direction, that's ob obviously good. And so the idea behind these actor critic approaches is to use a baseline that now even is not just purely merely a constant but that can depend on the state and reveals the expected return from that state and what's the expected return from the, that state? Well, that's the value function that we introduced before. So the value function, again, what is it? Uh, when I want to re-express it in terms of the Q function, is the expectation of the Q function of S comma A given that I'm in a certain state S and I'm taking this expectation over the policy that selects my actions. Could be any policy, it need not be the Q function policy. And that's the value of the state S. So what's the expected return if I'm in the state and follow the optimal policy? Um, and so if I introduce such a baseline, if I'm comparing my actual return against this expected return, I'm really answering the question, okay, I was in this state, how much better did I end up in the end than what I should have expected on average? That's an important question because it's not a big deal if, if you are in a good state and you're doing well in the end. Well, <laughs> that's not surprising, right? If I, give you, if I give you a million dollars to start with and you end up with $900,000, is that good or bad? It's actually bad because you lost money, yeah? But in comparison to many other people, you're financially still doing very good. So it's really this how you moved compared to the expectation that should be counted. Okay, and so what we introduce here is the so-called advantage, the advantage over the average that you did. Yeah? And the advantage is really, if I'm in a certain state and do a certain action, 
how do I compare against the average results from starting from that state? So against the value functions of Q of S comma A, which is action dependent, minus B of S, which is averaging over all the actions according to the current policy. How much better does the action A perform than what one expects on average from the state? And so just to go through the math a little bit, the first little uh, rule that I want to use is written down here. So if you give me two different uh, random variables uh, and one of them only depends on x and the other depends on x and another quantity y, then the expectation value of the product I can also rewrite in this fashion. I can say I take the expectation value of this f of x comma y with respect of y, given a fixed x, and then I multiply with g of x and still average over x. So it's, so to speak, averaging in two steps, okay? And so if I use this, I can now say the following. Look at this, so this is the reinforcement learning update. This is the r times the grad of the log of the action probabilities. And so now I claim it's the same as if I replace the r with a q function. And uh, this is true because the q function is just the expectation of this first term. And if you think a little bit about it, what I'm using is just this formula up here. So I'm replacing the r, that's, sorry, that's still fluctuating, with a q that is in principle the expectation value, but um, conditioned on the state and the action, and the state and the action are the only things that appear here on the right-hand side. So this works out. So that's the first step. I have replaced my usual reinforcement learning policy gradient update uh, with something that includes the Q function, but that's an exact step. And now I have, I introduced this idea again to uh, introduce the baseline to reduce the variance. So instead of using the Q functions at this spot, I'm using the difference between the Q function and the average of the Q function over the different actions that I could take, so the value. And again, this is not necessarily the optimal baseline, but the, to compute the optimal baseline would be much more complicated, and it's a good enough approximation. Good, so now this Q minus B by definition is the advantage, is called the advantage. Um, we still want to approximate even this. <laughs> and so the um, advantage I can write, so minus V is just the minus V from before, but uh, the rest here is an approximation for the Q function, so to speak, the immediate reward that I get plus this discounting factor times the, times the value of the next state. Okay, so now uh, this is the advantage formula that I will use so, so as to get rid of the Q function. So now the, there's no Q function appearing anymore. And the V, I will actually learn from a Bellman type equation. So uh, one can write a Bellman equation not only for the Q function but for the V function. It looks almost the same. I've written it down here and then one can, can apply this iterative fixed point update rule uh, that I discussed for the Q function, I want to kind of apply to the V function again with a small update step alpha. And so what people then do is to put everything together, they use a neural network for approximating the V function. So it's a neural network where you put in the state and out comes a value, which is the value of that state. Um, and then they use this update rule whenever they go through a trajectory to become a little bit better in their approximation of the value function. So now overall, we have two things. We still are using a policy and we are updating the policy according to this formula but using a nice good baseline, so effectively using the advantage. And we are also using a value network in order, well, to be able to calculate this advantage. And so that's then finally uh, how these actor critic uh, methods work. Let me see. Okay, so uh, this is the last slide of this technical part and then I have to see how I proceed. Um, so what do people use nowadays? So if you don't know anything else, what I propose is uh, a technique called PPO, proximal policy optimization. That is one of the many uh, uh, advantage actor critic uh, techniques 
It's very stable, very robust. You can use it not only for discrete actions, but also for continuous actions. Um, and you don't need to program it yourself. So um, just as with the rest of machine learning, by now there are multiple frameworks out there. And I list a few of them. Stable baselines started out for TensorFlow, then uh, nowadays it's PyTorch. Uh, then there's TensorFlow agents, obviously for TensorFlow. There's pure JAX RL <laughs> for JAX. Uh, and there are many others. So you can really um, pick whatever you want. And the nice thing about these uh, frameworks for RL is um, you can e relatively easily exchange one approach for another. I say relatively easily because different approaches have different hyperparameters and so on. So whenever you do this, you still need to at least look in the description and uh, make a few choices. Uh, but it's, uh, it's relatively easy. Um, OK. So let me see. So we still have 20 minutes or something like this. Yeah. And then there would be the break, and then there would be the next session. OK, so I'm first I pause for questions, and then I can still uh, tell you something about uh, continuous uh, actions. So are there questions at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, or baseline, it's, it's called baseline, really. Um, ah, yes, absolutely, yes. So, yeah, just to remind everyone. Um, yeah, so, this dramatically <laughs> uh, teaches everyone that if you don't do any of these baseline things, you get the green line for the variance, which is really bad, has high fluctuations, and scales also, in this case, badly with a number of steps. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, this is done with a so-called optimal baseline. Um, and in this particular example, I'm e even showing how it would be calculated. Um, but it's a little bit harder to calculate, and people don't actually use this. Yeah. Uh, so what this advantage actor critic thing is already an approximation to this optimal baseline. Uh, any other questions here? Okay, no. So then let me switch to the blackboard and uh, still tell you something about um, continuous actions. That's also very important. So imagine you are doing some physics um, where do I? Okay, so imagine you're doing some physics application. And it's relatively likely that you will uh, want to steer your physics experiment with continuous control. So instead of the actions being up, down, left, or right, uh, it's much more likely that you want to send a microwave pulse down to your quantum experiment, and you want to choose the amplitude and maybe the frequency of this pulse. So these are obviously continuous parameters. So that would mean that the action is really something continuous. And now how to do this. Yeah? So one, uh, one possibility would be to discretize this continuous range of actions. And then you are back to the case of discrete actions. The problem with that is, well, the first problem is uh, the finer you discretize, the more of these actions you have, so the more output neurons you will use. But the bigger problem is if this is now uh, an action in a higher dimensional space, so let's say two-dimensional space, you could still discretize it, but the number of little pixels in your discretization now goes quadratically with a number of discretization bins, so like n squared. And so this really becomes painful. Yeah? So that's not a good way pr to proceed. So what do people do when they have continuous actions? And so here's the idea. So instead of outputting action probabilities on a discretized grid, 
uh, you say my action probabilities are really like a Gaussian. So this is A, and this is the action probabilities that my neural network um, produces, so to speak. But how do I do that? Well, the neural network, you can ask the neural network to predict the center of the Gaussian and maybe also the spread of the Gaussian. So what will happen is you have your state as input, then you have all your hidden layers, and then you have in this one-dimensional case only two neurons. One produces mu, the other produces sigma. And afterwards, you just apply the usual gradient uh, reinforcement learning policy gradient update rule. So you can calculate by hand the grad log of this uh, Gaussian distribution that I could write like this, mu and sigma. But these mu and sigma themselves, they are outputs of the neural network. So I can write them like something like mu theta of s and sigma theta of s. And so um, the log of a normal distribution is easy to calculate. And in the next step, uh, you apply the grad to the mu and the sigma, and that's done by your auto automatic differentiation in your neural network. And so this is the way uh, people introduce continuous actions. And this scales very nicely if you have a higher dimensional space, because you d then just have more mu's and more sigmas, and so you go to a higher dimensional space, so no problem with that. And so now you can think about what, what really happens here. Uh, you could have thought I, I would just have a neural network predict a single output A. Yeah? That's another choice you could make. The neural network is asked to produce one continuous output A. But that's not good because it goes back from the original concept of having probabilities at, uh, as outputs. And you can also see why it's not good because then you will never explore what would have happened at other values of A. So the point of having this probability distribution, or in this case the Gaussian, is that you always want to wiggle a little bit. So sometimes when you sample from this uh, Gaussian, you will take this value, sometimes you take that value, and so on. So you wiggle a little bit around the possible continuous values A. Sometimes you get a higher reward, sometimes you get a lower reward. And this is exactly what gives you the real signal that teaches you in the end, okay, whenever I randomly go to a slightly smaller value of A, actually I get a higher reward. So basically, overall, I should be probably be moving my mu to the left. And so this is the thing uh, that people do for continuous actions. Um, OK. Any questions on this? Yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, Ah, okay, very good question. So what people do in practice is typically they only put the diagonal elements of this covariance matrix, so this uh, individual sigmas. Yeah. Um, I've not really seen applications where they put the full covariance matrix, but maybe if you, um, maybe you have some physics insights into your particular application and then maybe you know that, I don't know, th there is a good reason for making them dependent uh, on each other. But the, it's not that important because in the end, you are, in most cases that one can think of, eventually your policy will still converge to a deterministic policy, so meaning that the sigmas will actually shrink. It's just important during the training that you have this little wiggle room, but it's not so important that these are wiggling in a correlated way, so to speak. It's just that each of them has a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. So that's another possibility, and some people also do this. So maybe the sigma is not something that the network predicts, but the sigma could be something that you choose, that's what you say, and then reduce during the course of the training. Um, here it's maybe a little bit nicer if the network predicts it because it can somehow adapt itself, uh, because you maybe don't know what would have been the, the good choice of sigma in a certain situation. 
uh, here the network can start with a very broad, uh, very large choice of sigma initially, and then maybe quickly realize, oh no, I know pretty well which uh, deterministic value of A I need, and so I can reduce my sigma very quickly. So that's the only difference. But yes, one could do what you say. Okay. So I guess, since I don't believe I have time anymore to, to go into some Jupyter notebook, because that would be quite another thing, I would say we stop at this point and make a little bit longer break, and then we come back, and then I show you some physics examples. Okay. <laughs>